Hello, everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 161 of the Movement Debrief. And today, folks, I'm gonna keep it straight with you in the leg raise form because that's what we're gonna talk about. We're talking about the straight leg raise, how to improve your straight leg raise. If your straight leg raise is stuck and you're thinking, what the heck? Don't worry, your boy Big Z is gonna help you keep it in check because your boy, Senor Z Grande, has got a bunch of questions that have been asked by the people. They will be answered for the people by this people right here, fam recognized fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first and only question today, we're gonna do a little shorter one, but it ain't gonna be sweet. Comes from my dude, Marcel, and here's what he asks. I am finding that I can get some nice changes with table tests with the right exercises. The one that seems to change the slowest, however, is the straight leg raise. Any suggestions for how to get some quicker changes with this? Well, I got a bunch of suggestions and I'm about to give it to you. First question we got to ask ourselves is, okay, straight leg raise, so what? Who cares? Why is this an important measure? Well, I'm glad you asked. The reason why a straight leg raise is an important measure is because it gives you a good approximation of both external rotation-based movement capabilities and internal rotation-based movement capabilities, especially in the early ranges of hip flexion. As I talked about in last week's debrief, which will be linked in the show notes, which will be found on zackcouples.com forward slash improve dash straight dash leg dash raise. Go ahead and check it out. And also there will be links to a lot of the other show notes in there, especially if you are gonna be in North Carolina, um, November 6th and 7th for Human Matrix, the early bird ends tonight neither here nor there, but definitely check it out. Anyways, so as I alluded to in that particular debrief, there's three phases of hip flexion, and each phase of hip flexion has a different rotational element about it. From zero to 60, you're getting uh, external rotation action, which requires more posterior expansion or posterior extensibility. And then at about 60 degrees, the line of pull of your posterior rotator changes. So when you move from 60 to 100, you're having more of an internal rotation-based action, assuming you're maintaining the hip in the, the sagittal plane. Then once you start going 100 and beyond, all the way to full, that's when we get a re-external rotation action. But now the issue with hip flexion is because the knee is bent when you're testing, it's a lot easier to, to get through those early ranges without issues. But someone might be cheating, picking up motions elsewhere, and it's a little bit harder to see that with the straight leg raise because the leg is straight. There's a little bit more tension within the lower extremity as you're testing it. I like it because it does a better job of picking up those early ranges of hip flexion if there's a limitation. Now that's all testing well and good. Cool, Zach. I don't give a rat's padiddly about that. Why else should I look at the straight leg raise? Well, folks, if you do any hinging with your supreme clientele, especially the single leg variety, you probably should give a rat's patooey about the straight leg raise. And the reason why, folks, is if I'm doing something like a, a single leg RDL, and I'll try to bring my son in the mix to demo this, but when I go into a single leg RDL like that, well, if I look at the hip positioning I'm in right now, where I got about 90 degrees of hip flexion with the leg relatively straight, and the back leg is an extension, well, if I flip it upside down, well, by golly, bows, fam, that looks like a full straight leg raise. So if your peeps got a straight leg raise that is, you know, that, 20 degrees, the hinge probably isn't gonna go so well. And you can, you can do your darn just to coach it up. That's fine. A lot of times you can get people better with that. But if you're doing that, you're coaching the snot out of the move and it's still not improved, the straight leg raise may be something to consider looking at. And so that's why it's an important test. Now, let's go into the different phases that I look at within the straight leg raise and what you can do about it to improve each of these. And as I do that, I wanna mention something because Marcel says, 
that he gets a lot of other measures improving, but not the straight leg raise. Lately for me, this has probably been one of the first tests that I look at for improving hip range of motion. And the reason why that is, is because it picks up that early external rotation action better than the other tests. For example, if you're looking at hip, hip external and internal rotation at 90 degrees of hip flexion, but you have a straight leg raise that's 30, well, you're likely doing something wonky to potentially get into that orientation. And so you may not be able to get a good representation of what's going on with those rotational actions. Doesn't mean that you're not making improvements in someone's movement, but it could be that missing that early phase of hip flexion could be limiting your, your progress in, in some folks. So the straight leg raise is extremely important, especially if you have someone who has less than 45 degrees. It becomes like your top thing to look at. And so let's go into each of the phases that I look at from a decision-making standpoint. When I'm thinking of improving someone's straight leg raise, I'm thinking three phases just like I did for hip flexion. The first and most important is zero to 45 degrees. In that range, there is an external rotation action about the hip as you're moving through it. And it's generally a little bit less of a range compared to if you're just checking pure hip flexion. And the reason why that is is because of the knee extension element. Because of the knee extension element, knee extension creates tibial external rotation. Well, if I externally rotate that tibia and I keep the femur fixed, you can see that it's a relatively internally rotated position. Therefore, if I'm starting in an IR position, it would make sense that the, the ER field is likely to be reduced. And if you have someone who has a limitation in a straight leg raise that's like 45 or less, you got to be thinking early external rotation and you got to be thinking low key activities to improve that. Because if someone is limited in the early phases of hip flexion, chances are they're going to have multi-directional limitations, lots of tension in the system, compression everywhere. They're going to be stiff peeps. And you want to try to do your darndest to unstiffify those peeps. That is the technical term. Trust me, I'm a doctor. So I want you to think of it this way. And I love this analogy from uh, my mentor, Daddy O Pops, Bill Hartman. Check him out, BillHartmanPT.com. But he uses a toothpaste tube to uh, give us an uh, appreciation for how movement works. And so if we could imagine this toothpaste tube, the, uh, the toothpaste is uh, various fluids within your body. Let me see if I can get that into focus. Boom. There we go. But the toothpaste tube is various fluids within your body. And if you squeeze part of the toothpaste tube, you can see space is reduced. And it shoots the toothpaste where there's more space available. Muscle contractions work very similarly. When I contract a muscle, I squeeze the synovial fluid in this case to the opposing side of the joint and movement occurs. If you have someone who has a severe limitation in a straight leg raise, which I would classify that as 45 degrees or less, that person's kind of squishing their toothpaste in all directions, and therefore they can't move. They're going to have to compensate in some way, shape, or form. That could lead to some limiting factors. That could limit the exercise menu that you choose for them in the gym. That could potentially be a contributing factor, not the cause, but a contributing factor to someone experiencing pain. And so what we want to do, if we got someone who's squishing the toothpaste tube every which way, we got to let go of that squeeze, folks. And the way we do that is with more low tension, low intensity activities. Rolling has been one of my biggest ways of improving, or my improving someone's straight leg raise capabilities, especially in these early ranges. And when you're coaching these roles, you want to make sure it is slow, boring, methodical, and with as little tension as humanly possible. Because we're looking at an external rotation-based action within this portion of the roll, I want to keep my hip flexion generally 60 or below. And so um, the foam roller roll, which, I, which is on my YouTube channel, check it out, it shows that couples. But the foam roller roll is going to work within that range. 
And I've been pretty consistent with improving the straight leg raise with that particular move. But as long as you think I need to move slow, chill pace, and I need to bias external rotation, think zero to 60, you can drum up an ad nauseum number of moves. Also, if you have manual skills, because you are a manual therapist, doing very low, gentle mobilizations, you know, you could do light, soft tissue, rocking back and forth, gentle, gentle oscillatory compressions, all of those can also work really well in this particular situation. Once you've done the rolling, that looks pretty good. We're getting some nice changes. I would then likely progress to some type of toe touch progression. And what you could do for that, there's one that I like where I elevate the heels and I have people just breathe, silent in through the nose, get, get a fair amount of air out and just work on small movements of the calcaneus. That seems to be really useful at creating an eccentric position or orientation of the lower uh, posterior rotators because that's really in this range what we're trying to improve range of motion of. Caveat to the toe touch. If you have someone who's uber flexible, and you can have this, this does exist. I've had people with a limited straight leg raise, but perhaps they can pick up a ton of motion in the spine or elsewhere. Toe touch progressions might not be the best choice. And the reason why that is, is because they're likely gonna bypass getting the eccentric positioning in the posterior lower portion of the pelvis and they'll likely do so through the spine. So you're probably not gonna get the eccentric position that you will so desire. So what I would do instead is I would be looking at something in deep hip flexion to see if we could get it that way with the knees flexed. And that would be how I would dress the early phases of the straight leg raise. Now let's suppose, folks, that you got that and you're ready to move on up to the next stage. Stage two is 45 to 60 degrees. And the reason why I call this stage two is because you can't look at the straight leg raise alone if you have someone in the middle zone. And the reason why is because the transition point from external rotation to internal rotation is going to be different for each individual. So then how do you know which way you gotta go? You gotta bring in some friends. Folks, call me Regis Philbin because I'm gonna let you phone in two friends and your friends are hip external and internal rotation at 90. I would look at these and if you see a limitation in external or internal rotation in these particular situations, then chances are you will better be able to guide yourself on where you need to go. For example, if someone is still limited in external rotation, they can't hit 60 degrees, well, then it would probably behoove you to do more external rotation-based activities. But you might be able to move away from some of the lower easy rolling progressions. Something like a higher depth squat could be really good here. If you have someone who has an internal rotation deficit and let's say external rotation is full, then you might do something to improve internal rotation. This could be working at 60 to 100 degrees of hip flexion. This could be doing, and generally what I'll do in this case is I'll start teaching lateral tilting activities because those activities are also useful at improving IR in the side that you're tilting towards. So if the left hip, the hemipelvis is coming up, I'm gonna improve internal rotation capabilities on the left side. And so something like a uh, table side stride exercise that I use, or even doing like nice, easy, uh, one that I've been really liking a lot is like a lateral squat chop. Both of those are really good at teaching early phase internal rotation based activities. So when 45 to 60, you gotta be careful because it could go either way. Use other tests to help guide you on which you gotta go after next. Let's say you've cleared 60. Things are looking pretty hunky-dory. Where do you go next? Well, to finish the job going 60 to about 90, 70, depends on who you're working with. There, you wanna bias internal rotation city. I like RDL activities for this, especially if you do an offset version or um, you know, uh, some people call this a Camperini deadlift because they're single um, arm versions. A lot of times I'll just do a double arm hold and do an offset hinge. That seems to work really well at clearing up internal rotation. And I would work towards something like that. And those are the three phases. So zero to 45, rolling, ER bias, toe touch progressions, 
45 to 60 could go either way. You might either go higher depth hip flexion, mid depth hip flexion, or lateral tilting if you need ER for the first thing, so high depth. Middle depth and lateral tilting, that's more IR focused. Use hip ER and IR to be your guide. And then lastly, in finishing the job from 60 to say 70, 90, whatever we're looking at, that's where I would drive internal rotation thinking RDL progressions, single leg RDL that is. All of those work really well. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about what if someone has a crazy straight leg raise, one that makes gold member envious. Isn't that weird? Well, if you have someone who's got a large straight leg raise, like 90, 120, something nuts, and they're limited elsewhere, in that situation, the way that they've acquired that is via anteriorly tilting or orienting the pelvis to a fairly large degree. Enough so that they've allowed an eccentric position to occur in the posterior lower portion of the pelvis. And if you see this, well, we're not gonna go after straight leg raising even more, no. What you have to do is you gotta get those puppies to pull themselves back. You gotta posteriorly tilt or orient the pelvis. Folks, you gotta stack. How else are you gonna talk to your boy, Zach? With these folks, do something perhaps in hook lying. Hook lying's nice because it might create a little bit of concentric positioning in the posterior lower portion of the pelvis, which I actually need. And it's gonna help teach them to bring their center of mass backwards. And that would be how I would attack the straight leg raise. So to summarize this amazing question by my dude, Marcel, sure if you're listening, you got three phases, zero to 45, more ER bias, 45 to 60, ER or IR to transition zone, 60 to full, which is 70 to 90, that's more IR focused. So you wanna do tasks to tackle each of those. Probably the most important is getting that rolling in the early phases because a lot of people will be limited that. And I would strongly encourage you to go ahead and tackle the straight leg raise first and foremost when you're looking at some of your lower body stuff, if it's 45 or less. As you're approaching that middle zone, then you wanna start really taking into consideration other tests. And improving that is gonna make hinging go a heck of a lot better for you and your supreme clientele. That's a good stopping point for us today. Again, folks, if you are tuning on Instagram, thank you. Human Matrix, North Carolina, Charlotte. The early bird ends tonight, 11.55 p.m. Eastern time, or Pacific time, excuse me. Go ahead and check that out. But I hope you have an amazing weekend. You've been a wonderful, incredible, outstanding audience. I hope that you keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving. And I'll see you next time. Deuces.